Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. The Russian military recently moved as many as 40,000 troops along with tanks, armored vehicles, and Air Force units to staging areas along Russia's border with the Ukraine. Russia is also holding massive military exercises nearby. The Washington Free Beacon reports, the military exercises are an ominous sign. Similar large-scale Russian exercises were conducted near Ukraine a month before Moscow carried out the covert military operation to take over the strategic Black Sea Peninsula. That's referring to Crimea. In March 2014, even more ominous may be the U.S. response to Russia's military movements. Infowars says that the U.S. is reportedly moving nukes from Turkey to Romania amid rising tensions in Ukraine. On August 11, the Los Angeles Times ran an editorial by Steve Andreessen. It was entitled, Let's Get Our Nuclear Weapons Out of Turkey. Andreessen is a national security consultant to the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He pointed out the suddenness with which the U.S. lost its embassy to a group of Iranian students in 1979. He wrote, there are no do-overs in history, but there are lessons. The 1979 hostage crisis should have taught us the importance of proactively responding to obvious threats and removing vulnerable targets, a lesson that should be applied now if there are U.S. nuclear weapons based in Turkey. The Incirlik Air Base is used by both the 39th Air Base Wing of the U.S. Air Force and the Turkish Air Force. It sits in an urban area of 1.7 million people. The base is a major NATO installation, and it is a well-known secret that it houses a large stockpile of nuclear weapons. The recent coup attempt in Turkey exposed the vulnerability of those weapons. Andreessen asked, what if any American Turkish protesters, believing the U.S. was behind the coup plot, decided to march on Incirlik chanting anti-American and anti-Israeli slogans, as has actually happened, and taken over the base? Incirlik is only 70 miles from Syria, and that makes it vulnerable to ISIS too. Andreessen says, in March, the Pentagon reportedly ordered military families out of southern Turkey, primarily from Incirlik, due to terrorism-related security concerns. If multiple reports are correct, the United States is about to move, or has already moved, the Incirlik nuclear arsenal. You might reasonably expect the U.S. to move the nukes to France or Great Britain, but instead, we're moving them to Romania, a nation that borders Ukraine. Uh, but President Obama apparently wanted to send a message to Vladimir Putin. And did he ever. The Russians are said to be outraged. The move has raised already high tensions between the two nuclear superpowers. Earlier this summer, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter said, Moscow's nuclear saber-rattling raises troubling questions about Russia's leaders. Respect for norms against the use of nuclear weapons and whether they respect the profound caution that nuclear age leaders showed with regard to the brandishing of nuclear weapons. NATO's new Supreme Allied Commander, U.S. Army General Curtis Scaparati said Russian doctrine states that tactical nuclear weapons may be used in a conventional response scenario. That means Russia no longer sees these weapons as a last resort. They now think of them as a viable alternative in a host of conventional scenarios. 
Russian fighter jets continue to perform low-altitude flybys of American ships, and the Russian Navy has increased in submarine patrols off the U.S. coast. Russia is in the midst of a huge buildup of nuclear-capable missiles, and they are modernizing their nuclear infrastructure from top to bottom. Mark Schneider of the National Institute for Public Policy summed up like this. Russia is getting ready for a big war which they assume will go nuclear. With them launching the first attacks, Russia's growing first strike capability takes particularly ominous turn in, of all places, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Of late, Iran has allowed Russia to conduct military operation from Iranian soil. That is unprecedented. The mullahs running Iran have never before allowed any foreign power to base any of its military in their country. The Russians recently flew missions into Syria using Hamadan Air Base west of Tehran as their staging area. Ezekiel chapter 30 describes one of the pivotal moments of end time scenarios. Russia and Iran are named in scripture as Magog and Persia. They will lead a confederation of nations in a massive invasion of Israel. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia and Iran became antagonists. But that changed dramatically. One year ago, when the leader of Iran's Quds Force, General Qasim Soleimani, defied international sanctions to visit Moscow. He was welcomed there. And after that, things began to change fast. Today, Russia and Iran are as thick as thieves, just as the Bible predicted for the end times. During the 2012 U.S. presidential election, candidate Mitt Romney called Russia, without question, our number one geopolitical foe. In one of the debates, President Obama had a zinger all prepared for Romney. The president said, Governor Romney, I'm glad you recognize Al-Qaeda is a threat because a few months ago, when you were asked what is the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia, not Al-Qaeda. You said Russia. And the 1980s are now calling to ask for their foreign policy back. Clever, but empty and dead wrong. Neither Al-Qaeda nor ISIS nor any other terrorist group has thousands of hydrogen warheads. That is the most lethal weapon known to man. They are mounted on intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at the United States, and they are carried aboard submarines prowling America's coast. From those underwater platforms, they are capable of striking this country in a matter of minutes and with unimaginable power and fury. That, Mr. President, was and remains America's number one geopolitical threat, whether or not you understand it. The new Muslim mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, is wasting no time. It was recently announced that he is ready to use the full force of London's Metropolitan Police Service to protect that city's Muslim minority at all costs. The Metropolitan Police Service is better known as Scotland Yard. In an online statement, the service said, the Metropolitan Police Service take hate crime very seriously and encourage members of all communities to report incidents to the police. Even if the incident does not amount to a crime, the police will still record and investigate it. A hate crime is where you become a victim of any crime or prejudice because of your race, faith, age, sexual orientation, gender, or because you have a disability. You do not have to prove that the incident or crime was motivated by prejudice. If you or any other person believes that it was, then it will be dealt with as a hate crime. 
evidence? Who needs evidence? If you just heard someone say something that you or anyone else thinks might be motivated by prejudice, then it will be dealt with as a hate crime. Over the last few years, we've seen preachers of the gospel haul to London jails because someone thought their words were hateful. Tolerance in Great Britain has become a one-way street. And when it comes to harassment, nobody can harass you like Scotland Yard. Now they promise police harassment of anyone even accused of saying something negative about Islam. Whether or not a law is actually broken, since when have religious ideas been exempt from scrutiny? But Islam is more than a religion. It is a political ideology. A free society must be able to openly criticize political ideas or it will not remain free. Women in London are increasingly afraid to go outside their homes alone at night. In fact, that's now typical of Europe generally. Police officials across the continent have been told either to not report Muslim criminal acts or report them in a way that does not show any relationship to Islam. In Germany, the rape crisis that began last year has gotten worse, not better. The Gatestone Institute's Soren Kern reports Germany's migrant rape crisis has now spread to cities and towns in all 16 of Germany's federal states. Germany now finds itself in a vicious circle. Most of the perpetrators are never found, and the few who are frequently receive lenient sentences. Only one in 10 rapes in Germany is reported, and just 8% of rape trials result in convictions. Up to 90% of the sex crimes committed in Germany do not appear in the official statistics. A high-ranking police officer told the German newspaper Bild, there are strict instructions from the top not to report offenses committed by refugees. It is extraordinary that certain offenders are deliberately not being reported about and the information is being classified as confidential. This summer, women and children have been sexually assaulted in large numbers at public swimming pools and outdoor festivals. But the government there has chosen to protect the migrant rapists, not their victims. The German newspaper Die Welt reported earlier this year that authorities across the nation have been suppressing data about migrant criminality. Renier Wynn, head of the German police union, said, every police officer knows he has to meet a particular political expectation. It is better to keep quiet about migrant crime because you cannot go wrong. Last year, Chancellor Angela Merkel pushed her nation to bring in a million refugees. She famously said, we can do this. After four recent terror attacks in Germany, she interrupted her summer holiday to address the nation, and she said, I am still convinced today that we can do it. She's also still convinced that her open-door immigration policy has not been a cause of terrorism. She said, the phenomenon of Islamic terrorism of ISIS is not a phenomenon that has come to us through the refugees, but one we already had. She's right that they already had a problem with Islamic terrorists, but now Germans can expect an explosion of such terrorism. Her policies have now thoroughly entrenched Islamic terrorism in the culture of Germany. Now let's talk about some good news. Recently on this program, I discussed the concept of propitiation. This week, I would like to look at it in more depth. Romans chapter three says that we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. 
whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The Bible says Christ died to satisfy the offended righteousness and justice of God and to turn away wrath from those who believe in him. This included Old Testament believers, people who lived before the cross. And that's what it means when it says he passed over the sins previously committed. God put the sins of those Old Testament saints on a charge account which was guaranteed to be paid by the promise of the coming Savior. Romans 3 also says that Jesus was displayed publicly as a propitiation. God did this so that the whole world would know that his offended character had been satisfied by Jesus' death. The world would know that now he remains perfectly just in declaring righteous all who would believe in his son, substitutionary death on their behalf. All this was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. The most important part of the tabernacle was an inner room called the Holy of Holies. Within this room was a small acacia wood box covered with gold, the Ark of the Covenant, if you're a movie fan, you know about Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's a fictional story about the Ark of the Covenant. It is also called the Ark of the Testimony and the Ark of God. Everything about the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant fits perfectly with the story of redemption in Jesus. I can't go into all of it here, but if you want more details, you can find it in my book, amazing grace. The Greek word for propitiation is helisterion. This same word also means mercy seat. Propitiation is a concept, but the mercy seat had a physical location. It was the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. The rest of the Ark was wood overlaid with gold. The top, our mercy seat, was a slab of pure gold. Attached to the mercy seat were statues of two angels facing each other with their heads bowed toward the ark. Between the angels was a representation of God's presence on earth. In Exodus chapter 25 verse 22, God said to Moses, I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. Cherubim is the plural form of the word cherub. But they're not the chubby little baby-faced beings we associate with the word cherub. Cherubim are a special order of angels always associated with guarding the holiness of God. Even now, cherubim stand guard at the gates of Eden, protecting the tree of life. God instructed that the face of the angels be looking toward the mercy seat, as if looking toward the contents of the ark. God told Moses exactly what items to place inside the ark. Manna from Israel's journey in the wilderness, the rod of Aaron, and the pieces of stone on which God had written the Ten Commandments the one Moses broke when he found Israel in sin as he came down from Sinai. The manna represents a man's rejection of God's material provision. Aaron's rod that budded represents man's rejection of God's leadership. And the broken tablets of law represent man's rejection of God's holiness. So the Ark of the Covenant contained exhibits A, B, and C, proving humanity's guilt before a just and holy God. When cherubim, the guardians of God's holiness, looked down on the symbols in the ark, 
they saw human sinfulness. But one day a year, they saw something different. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest of Israel would enter the Holy of Holies. He would take the blood of an animal sacrifice and sprinkle it over the top of the mercy seat. On that day, the guardians of God's holiness no longer saw the symbols of human sin. Instead, they saw the blood of a divinely ordained innocent sacrifice covering the sin. As I mentioned, the ark's golden lid served as a throne for God on earth until the blood of the animal was sprinkled on the mercy seat. This throne of God depicted a place of judgment. But covered by the blood once a year, it became a throne of mercy or the mercy seat. From his throne, God could then show the facet of his character called mercy. That's because his righteousness and justice were satisfied by the blood of a sacrifice which had been ordained. Once his righteousness and justice were satisfied, God could justly pour out his love on anyone who came to him by faith alone. God's love poured out on the basis of propitiation is what we call grace. The ritual God laid out for the children of Israel to carefully follow is a picture of something very real in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 calls the earthly ark and the holy of holies a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. The real things actually exist in heaven. The cherubim there are not statues but living angels. And in heaven, the high priest is none other than Jesus himself. The blood he sprinkled on the actual heavenly mercy seat was his own. Covering man's sin is the blood of Jesus Christ placed there by our high priest, also Jesus, placed there so that we who were filthy sinners can enter the perfectly holy presence of God guilt-free and with joy and singing. Under the old covenant, the high priest had to sprinkle the bud once every year on the day of atonement. But Jesus did it once for all time and eternity. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12 says, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus, as our high priest, actually entered the holy of holies in heaven with the blood of an absolute perfect sacrifice, his own blood. There, he sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the heavenly tabernacle and obtained not just a temporary year-long forgiveness for men, but eternal redemption. He did it once for all. This means it doesn't have to be done again and again as with the former priest and the blood of animals. And by this, he obtained eternal redemption. How long is eternal? For those who receive it, this redemption lasts throughout eternity. All those saved by this sacrifice are saved forever. They can never be lost again. Now I know that there may be a number of you who have somehow assumed Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you have to verbally say that I believe that you died for my sins and passed them away and that you came into my heart through the Holy Spirit to live forever. Even when I'm out of fellowship, the Holy Spirit still keeps striving with me to make me want to live the new life in the new nature that God gives me. Pray right now. Thank you for forgiving my sins, Lord Jesus and come into my heart 
and make me what you want me to be. That's it for tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.